Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to On Course with Liberal Arts. Today's topic is constitutional principles. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Eric Dempsey. Dr. Dempsey is the assistant director of UT's Thomas Jefferson Center for the St Study of Core Texts and Ideas. While an undergraduate at St. John's College in Annapolis, Dr. Dempsey began to study the great books seriously. He went on to complete his doctorate in political science at Boston College. During his time at UT, he has taught courses on constitutional principles, classics of social and political thought, classical quest for justice, might and right among nations, Jerusalem and Athens, and intro to ancient Greece. He completed his doctorate at Boston College in June 2007. Dr. Dempsey is currently authoring a book based on his dissertation of Thomas Aquinas' interpretation of Aristotle in terms of natural law and Marsilius of Padua's critique of Thomas. Please send your questions via the chat function and we will answer as many as possible in the last half of the webinar. And now I turn it over to Dr. Dempsey. Well, thank you so much, Angie, for that kind introduction. Uh, welcome to all of you. My name is Eric Dempsey, uh, uh, Dr. Dempsey, as Angie said. I'm the assistant director of the Thomas Jefferson Center. Uh, uh, that's the great books program here at UT Austin. Um, I've been here at UT for about 10 years, and I'm here to speak to you all today on the topic of constitutional principles, um, as Angie said. Um, now, the material that I'll be covering about, my topic, uh, 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 grows out of a course that our students are offered through the Thomas Jefferson Center, um, something that they're all required to take as they complete our program. Actually, I should say just a word about our center, since you may not all be familiar. Um, we're a program focused on liberal education and the great books. We offer a certificate to students from all different majors so that they can uh, uh, get at least a taste of a liberal and civic education while they're here at the university, even if they're majoring in things like engineering or natural sciences or business. Um, we here at the center think it's essential that people, that students, college students, have the opportunity while they're undergraduates to think about some of the fundamental questions of human life, to think about how human beings ought to live together, both uh, how they ought to live together collectively and how they ought to live as individuals. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to be speaking about one theme that comes from this course that we offer in our program. Right? Um, uh, this is, as I said, one of the required courses and something that we ask all of our students to take. Um, this course, the one that this talk, today's talk is based on, is one that I've been teaching as long as I've been here. So that's about 10 years. Um, it's a course on the political thought informing American politics, right? Um, we call it constitutional principles. That's not a, a constitutional law course, right? There are plenty of those in the law school that students can take, and those are valuable, of course. Um, but what we study is constitutional principles. That means the ideas that underlie the American Constitution and the American system of government and that helped to shape it. Um, that question, I think, is not one uh, uh, whose urgency I need to argue for at length. Um, obviously, just to understand our own political situation, to understand who we are, we need to understand something about the system of government under which we live. Um, but I would add or say that it's, it's also a question that we now recognize, especially after the last year or six, six, six months or a year or so, um, it's a question that we recognize as especially urgent. Um, people today often decry political polarization. Um, it does seem to me that we're more politically polarized than we've been through most of our history, right? It, it, it's hard not to, not to feel that strongly. Um, and some have even come to call into question whether the American system of government as a whole, right, whether, whether the American Constitution is legitimate and just. More and more, the suggestion has arisen that the core meaning or essence of the country since its beginning has been oppression and exploitation, right? Um, now, it seems to me that the story is not quite so simple, right? 
Um, and the purpose of this course is to introduce students to the ideas that underlie the American political system, right? Um, and also to introduce them to some of the ways in which great thinkers have responded to those ideas. Um, and in today's talk, I'm going to cover two main, two, two, two basic broad subjects. Um, in the first half, I just want to say something about what those original principles are, right? Just, just try to articulate something about the historical origins of American constitutional principles um, and to say something about how those were translated into a workable political regime. In the second half of the talk, uh, I'm going to pay special attention to the question of what those principles have meant to uh, some of the great African-American political thinkers, right? Some of the great ones from our tradition. I'll speak especially about Frederick Douglass, um, but I'm happy to speak about others also. That question has special urgency because, as we know, right, uh, um, uh, uh, the found, at the time of the founding of the country, uh, slavery was a part of what it was, right? It was, was, was allowed to continue to exist despite the obvious tension between, and I'll explain this later, but despite the obvious tension between allowing such an institution to exist and insisting on a fundamental, uh, insisting on a teaching about natural rights. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is trace out, especially with the view to Frederick Douglass, what the Constitution meant to him and what its principles meant to him. Um, but before we get that, the first half of the talk, uh, and the first half is going to be about um, uh, 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 what the American system of government is. Uh, now I'm going to share with you all a document. Um, this document is just a set of quotes that I've put together for this presentation. Um, you don't really have to pay attention to this. I won't read them all out, but I think that if you're sitting at your computer, uh, we'll give you something that you can look at so you can follow what we're doing and follow the kind of contours of the talk uh, a little bit more easily, right? It'll just give you a kind of visual cue and I'll, I'll read out, uh, um, I guess, the, uh, 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 the italicized parts of some of these quotes, but I wanted to give you a little bit more just so that you would know what you were looking at. So the first question is, what are the principles uh, of the American system of government? Um, we know from reading the American founders, especially the kind of, uh, the, 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 yeah, everyone from the era of the American founding recognized that they were doing something unique, right? Um, Hamilton has a beautiful statement of that in Federalist One. Let me read this out. So this is the italicized part from the first quote. Hamilton writes, it has frequently been remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may with propriety be regarded as the era in which that decision is to be made, and a wrong election of the part we shall act may, in this view, deserve to be considered as the general misfortune of mankind. Right? So for Hamilton, again, he's writing this at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, right? So the, at, at stake is whether the American Union would be able to persist but the question has more than a local political significance. It's not just about America as such, it's about the very possibility of rational self-government. Hamilton says, contrary to what one might expect, I mean, it's a somewhat bold, it's, it's, it's a bold claim, right? That in history, no one has ever set up a government from reflection and choice, done it deliberately and rationally, in the way that the Americans of his day now have an opportunity to do, right? If they succeed, he says, perhaps the whole world will recognize the possibility, will come to see, uh, will come to see as thinkable that human beings can rule themselves, can govern themselves through reason. 
if not, he worries politics will end up forever in the realm of chance, right? Uh, uh, it'll never rest on a truly rational foundation. Now, what does he mean by this bold claim? In what way does he see the American founding as so deeply unique? Well, the American founders were the first real political founders um, who were also students of a teaching that we now call classical liberalism, right? Um, they were students of a set of political philosophers, careful readers of a set of, uh, of political philosophers, um, beginning with figures like Montesquieu, and I mean, not just beginning with them, but above all, figures like Montesquieu and John Locke, um, who explained and defined a new way of thinking about government, a new way to organize human society as such. Right? Um, Montesquieu and Locke are the two whom they cite most often in the Federalist Papers. They're clearly the two most direct influences over the American founding. Locke is the Englishman and Locke is the one who wrote, uh, uh, who, who articulated the natural rights teaching more cl most clearly. So we, we focus on him for a minute, right? Um, John Locke was a, an English political philosopher who lived in the set, who wrote at least in the 17th century. Um, and his second treatise of government uh, gave a new portrait of what government is, what its purposes are, and what it should aspire to be. That portrait had enormous influence over the American founders. Um, and let me now read just a quote from Locke. This is number two on your, on your list if you see it, right? Um, again, I'm just going to read the end of this, not the whole thing, but the whole thing is, 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 is of some use. Um, uh, so Locke writes that a human being is willing to quit a condition which, however free, is full of fears and continual dangers, and it is not without reason that he seeks out and is willing to join in society with others who are already united or have a mind to unite for the mutual preservation of their lives, liberties, and estates, which I call by the general name property. Um, so this is a crucial line from the second treatise where Locke explains what he understands the core purposes of government to be, and, it's, and where he explains what he understands its nature to be. Um, and there are two things that, that I would accentuate from this, right? Two things that, that, that shape what liberalism is. Uh, first, the state comes into being on account of a deliberate decision that human beings make. Their original condition is a state of nature, um, and human beings enter into political society as a result of a deliberate choice. Second, they enter into that political society for specific reasons, right? And those are to protect what later come to be called their, their natural rights, or as Locke puts it in language that you'll recognize immediately from the Declaration, they enter into the society for the mutual preservation of their lives, liberties, and estates, uh, which he ends up calling property, right? He uses the name property to describe all of those. So we get a political system that does not exist by nature and that is oriented to securing certain rights or certain goods for individuals, right? Um, uh, this, 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 uh, in the class, we compare him to Aristotle, right? I'm happy to do this a little more in the questions if you like. Um, uh, but we compare him to Aristotle who asserts that human beings are political by nature, that every city exists by nature. That's not the case for Locke, right? For Locke, the city is something or, or the political community is something that we create as a result of a deliberate decision that we make. Okay? This political philosophy, this kind of new sort of political philosophy, uh, has enormous influence over the American founders, right? Um, um, you can see that, uh, I mean, they, they, it's, it's, it's the language that they speak, right? And you can see from these famous lines in the Declaration how closely American political thought uh, uh, depends upon and how closely tied it is to Locke's thought. Um, I'll read again quote three now. This is one that I suspect is familiar to most of you without my um, uh, uh, without my reading it, but it's worth reading it anyway, uh, just in order to see how close it is to the other. So he writes, 
This is Jefferson now, our, our, our own center's uh, namesake, right, uh, 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 who penned this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Um, it's the first part of the quote in particular that I want to focus on. Uh, what Locke describes as the ends of government, the Declaration casts as natural rights. The Declaration, too, says that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights, right? Not that they are, um, not that governments pre-exist those rights, not that a human being is oriented toward the common good as his own deepest good, um, but rather that government exists first and foremost to secure rights for individuals. Um, I should add to this, right, uh, 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 something I didn't mention yet. One big part of what this means, right, one, one, one big consequence of this uh, is, has to do with the relation between human citizens, right, um, and kings and leaders. John Locke's second treatise of government was written as part of a broader project that was intended to refute the divine right of kings, right? The idea that kings ruled by some decree that God made, uh, that they were not naturally equal to other human beings, but that they had a kind of priority or authority that was endowed in them by God, that was given to them by God, right? That's incompatible with liberalism. In liberalism, all human beings are created equal, um, and all of them enjoy those same unalienable rights. And even if those rights aren't always protected, you could say uh, it is a wrong or a wrong is done when they are not. Right? Uh, um, so every human being in the liberal teaching is somehow, we can talk about this more in the questions, but is, is somehow equal. Right? Um, okay. So when the Federalists assert that they are going to be the first that Americans are going to be the first to create a government founded on reason, right? Developed on the basis of reflection rather than chance. What they mean above all is that it's going to be the first instantiation, the first realization of this new political philosophy, right? One that claims to be more rational um, uh, uh, and one that, that teaches us, as it were, what uh, teaches us what a good government should be. The Constitution um, is based on that new understanding of government, right? It's based on this understanding of individual rights as the purposes of government. You can see, uh, I didn't include quotes, but you can, you can see echoes of that throughout the Federalist Papers, right? Um, and the idea is to, does the idea behind the Constitution, among the ideas of the Constitution, is to design a system of government that effectively protects individual rights. Right? Um, that also, we might say, uh, leads to a particularly American breed of patriotism. Um, you could call it a rational patriotism, right? It's a love of government, not just because it's ours, not just because it's our inheritance, but because Americans believe that the government is based on, is, is founded upon true principles, right? Um, and insofar as those principles are worth serving, we can legitimately love the country. Okay, so much for part one of this talk. Um, I'm now going to proceed to the second part, right? Um, uh, in which I'm going to address what, what I think is in a way the grave question that our political system has, has wrestled with since its very beginning. What do those principles mean to people whose rights were not protected, right? What do these, what, what, what does the articulation, what can the Declaration of Independence mean um, to someone whose rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness 
enjoyed no protection at all. Right? Um, uh, uh, those principles, as we know, were not practiced with respect to a massive segment of the population, slaves, right? African-American slaves. Right? What does one do with that fact? For some, it might be a reason to come to doubt the whole enterprise, right? Um, now, in this class, again, I, I think you guys will be interested in how we handle things in my class, right? Um, uh, so once we've spent a couple of months studying what the principles were and, and looking at a couple of different critiques of them, um, we turn to the tradition of African-American political thought, right? Uh, so we look at the writings of former slaves and the descendants of former slaves, uh, and we try to see how they grappled with this question of what they should think of the American Constitution. Right? Um, and in the class, we approach the question first and foremost through the example found in the writings of Frederick Douglass. Uh, now, Douglass, I suppose, is someone who is well known enough to everyone. Uh, he was born a slave in Maryland. We don't know exactly what year. Uh, and after he escaped, he became one of the leading intellects in the abolitionist movement. In this class, we read one of his biographies, uh, as well as several of his speeches. Um, for our purposes today, though, I want to focus on a specific transformation that he underwent with respect to his own thinking about the United States. To see where he began, right, um, I'd like to, to, again, call your attention to quote number four, right? Um, so this is something that Douglas wrote in 1849, just a couple of years after he became a free man. Um, he was already kind of uh, uh, rising in prominence because his, bio, his autobiography had been published and he was a well-known mind. Um, he wrote the following in a piece called Abolition Fanaticism. And I just want to read this because I think... Um, I think this poses the question with which he wrestled as clearly as anything. So just read. It says, I cannot agree with my friend, Mr. Garrison. That's William Lloyd Garrison, by the way. Um, I cannot agree with my friend, Mr. Garrison, in relation to my love and attachment to this land. I have no love for America as such. I have no patriotism. I have no country. What country have I? The institutions of this country do not know me, do not recognize me as a man. I am not thought of, spoken of in any direction out of the anti-slavery ranks as a man. How can I, I say, love a country thus cursed, thus bedewed with the blood of my brethren? A country, the church of which, and the government of which, and the constitution of which are in favor of supporting and perpetuating this monstrous system of injustice and blood. I have not, I cannot have any love for this country as such or for its constitution. I desire to see it overthrown as speedily as possible and its constitution shivered in a thousand fragments rather than this foul curse should continue to remain as now, right? Um, I've always found this an especially almost impossibly moving statement, right? The problem that Douglas wrestles with is how he could ever learn to be a patriot for, how he could ever learn to love a country in which he was a slave, he had been a slave at least, um, and in which millions of his brethren, as he puts it, uh, were still held as slaves. Was it not proper? he says, to wish to have this whole system of government abolished. Was the original sin not so great that you should do away with the whole thing? One of the things I have long found so compelling about Douglas, however, is that while he begins with that position in 1849, he undergoes a significant change of heart about it, right? Um, and it's a change of heart that's so important to him that he feels it necessary to publicly announce that change of heart. Uh, he announces it in this notice. It's quote number five. I'm just going to read the italicized part here. Um, uh, but he announces in 1851 that he has reversed his position on the Constitution, 
before he had believed that it was an intrinsically slave-holding document, right? That it was as bedewed with the blood of his brethren as the, as the whips of the masters in the South. By 1850, in 1851, in fact, he undergoes a significant change of heart, persuaded largely by some of his abolitionist allies. Let me now read out the, the relevant portion of the quote. He writes, we found, that's the royal, that's the, the authorial be there. Um, we found in our former position that when debating the question, we were compelled to go behind the letter of the Constitution and to seek its meaning in the history and practice of the nation under it. A process always attended with disadvantages. And certainly, we feel little inclination to shoulder, dis shoulder disadvantages of any kind in order to give slavery the slightest protection. In short, we hold it, slavery, to be a system of lawless violence, that it never was lawful and never can be made so, and that it is the first duty of every American whose conscience permits so to do, to use his political as well as his moral power for its overthrow. This significant change of heart that Douglas has has to do with how he reads the Constitution. Um, it's associated with a new political strategy, right? Rather than trying to abolish the Constitution simply, he now wants to find a way to use the tools of the Constitution to abolish slavery, but it grows out of a new reflection on what the Constitution was, right? Rather than something that was intrinsically slaveholding, he comes to read it in light of its history and so see it more as an instantiation of its principles, principles that he regards as true principles. Now, we could trace at length, and I'm happy to do more of this in the questions if you like, we could trace at length some of the reasoning that led him to that conclusion. Uh, one key fact, by the way, um, that, that, that's worthy of everyone's attention, uh, is that the word slavery never appears in the Constitution. And it does seem to be the case that that was done deliberately, right? So as not to give sanction to an institution that at least some of the framers regarded as so uh, diabolical, right? Um, but in addition to certain textual arguments, um, Douglas reflected uh, uh, more deeply on the history of the document, so he says, um, and concluded that it was better to read it in light of its principles, right? Those principles he came to identify as the principles of the Declaration of Independence, right? Um, and so, while of course recognizing that the Constitution did not abolish slavery, um, he saw it as something in which slavery was always regarded as a wrong, always regarded as something lawless and, and something, and, and, as a, and as a document which laid the foundation for the prospect of the eventual abolition of slavery. Um, he testifies to that most beautifully in his famous Fourth of July oration, right? Um, this is given in 1852, right? Uh, uh, so it's a year after that notice was published. Um, I think this is Douglas's most famous speech. It's certainly the one that's most frequently taught in high schools today, right? Um, and here again, I just want to read out his words a little bit. Um, so this is quote six now, and this one I'm going to read all of. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history. The very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, he even speaks about patriotism here, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles Stand by those principles, be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. And then skipping down a little, he says, fellow citizens, there is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinously imposed upon as that of the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. In that instrument I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing but interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. 
So we see this transformation that Douglas undergoes, right? Um, for him, at least. Deeper reading in, in the nation's history, right? Deeper thinking about its founding documents, deeper thinking about its principles, leads him to conclude that the Constitution should be read in light of the Declaration and that the Declaration's principles are true and even saving um, principles, right? Uh, in fact, I could add, this wasn't part of my talk originally, um, uh, but reading Douglas, one thing that I've, I've come to see is that he had just of any author, I think, one of the, well, any author I read, one of the, the, the best appreciations for what's good about a free life, right? This comes across not so much in these speeches, but in the narrative that he writes about his own life. Um, he knew slavery, right? He was born a slave and grew up a slave, and that gave him a better understanding of what was so good about freedom, right? Um, so he recognizes that an education, right, the ability to read, even to read great books and to think about your own situation makes you free, right? Um, he comes to see the value in being able to earn a living for yourself, and being able to work for a wage and to hope by that wage to improve your standing in life, right? Um, he knows what is, it means to have a family because he was deprived of his own, right? Uh, uh, in a way, I think what he says about a free life, I don't know if it's more beautiful, but it's, it's, it's at least as beautiful as what you find in, in the Declaration and in the founding documents. And I think it has a real urgency because he knew what it was like not to live uh, a free life. He knew what it was like to live as a slave. Anyway, Douglas is just one example in our class of a thinker, an African-American thinker who wrestles with the question of the meaning of America's constitutional principles, right? Wrestles with this liberal political tradition and tries to think about, tries to understand what it means to him. Um, in the course, right, uh, 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 we, we run through a whole sequence of them. And just for your curiosity, I posted a couple of exam questions that I ordinarily give, right? Um, uh, that happen to have to do directly with today's talk, right? Um, these are the kinds of reflections that we encourage students to engage in, um, and they're ones that I think are really essential for young people today, right? Um, as I've said, our, our, our center is at heart a teaching center. It's about preparing young people to be good citizens and to be leaders once they've left the university. It seems to me that these kinds of reflections, asking these kinds of questions, reading these kinds of books, um, is absolutely essential for anyone who wants to be an adult, free American citizen. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I'm happy to hang out and take questions. Maybe you could talk about the Thomas Jefferson Center and what the, the direction that, that you guys are going or future plans. Yeah, sure. Um, so our center, I don't know if people know this, but our, our center is still a relatively new center. It's, it's only been a kind of vibrant thing for, I don't know, eight years or so. It's, 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 it, it hasn't been around even as long as I have at the university. Um, uh, we've been expanding. <laughs> okay, thanks, Casey Jones. I'll, 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 I'll come to that in a minute. Um, uh, so we've been expanding our programming lately. Um, as I said, the, the basic thing that we do is prepare all of our students to earn a certificate in core texts and ideas. Um, that means that they get a kind of basic, uh, 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 a basic liberal education, which means that they study texts from world religions, the history of political philosophy, the classics, and American political thought. I thought today it would be helpful to highlight something from American political thought because it's, I mean, as I've said, our purpose in a way is to prepare students to be good citizens, right? And this is the kind of reflection I think that one has to engage in if one wants to be a good citizen. Um, uh, yeah, we have all kinds of extracurricular programming too. We're meant to be both an academic program and to have a sort of a, 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 a not exactly social component, but social intellectual component. We sponsor 
book clubs, uh, 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 readings. Um, we, we, when, when COVID is not an issue, we let students attend some cultural events in the area that we think will be intellectually edifying from classical music concerts to plays. Um, there's lots of stuff that we provide. Uh, and I think, I mean, I know we have a couple of our students here today. Maybe, maybe I can, I'm not going to make them, make them say anything. <laughs> They'd be horrified. But, um, uh, 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 but um, yeah, I, I think that we, we do give students an opportunity, again, whatever field they're going into, to take some of their time as an undergraduate and develop uh, intellectually. Okay, so I see a bunch of questions in the chat. Shall I just make my way through them? Yes, please feel free if you'd uh, like to read them yourself. Okay, I'm going to answer the easiest one first. Uh, Stephen Seltzer asks, just curious now, how many students graduate with this certificate in recent years? We've been graduating between, uh, uh, I think it's about 20 and 30 a year, and we expect those numbers to go up. We've been matriculating into our incoming freshman class. We've been, uh, our freshman classes have been uh, about 150 students for the past couple of years. Because of the virus, it was smaller this year. We had about 120 incoming students. Um, but yeah, we, we, we've been there. Our, our, our numbers have been increasing lately. We're still kind of a program on the rise, trying to find its footing and become something permanent. So um, I'm expecting, I don't know exactly what the numbers are for this fall, but I'm expecting them to go up. Um, okay, uh, how would you answer the compare Casey Jones Dennehy? asks, how would you compare, how would you answer the compare and contrast exam question two? All right, I guess I should have expected that when I gave you guys my exam question. Um, all right. So, uh, 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 Locke, I think, is the one who's closest to the Declaration of Independence. I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer this very briefly, right? Um, the first sequence of thinkers, Locke, Lincoln, Douglas, and King, are all strong believers in the principles that the Declaration articulates, right? Um, MLK is actually one of the most beautiful, I think, exponents of the principles of the Declaration. He describes it as a, a promissory note, right, that's finally come due. Um, Locke is the, you know, kind of philosophic predecessor of those principles. Lincoln is the one who most strongly makes the case that the Constitution should be read as the embodiment of the Declaration, that the Declaration is, in a way, more essential to the American founding than the Constitution. Um, the last three, Du Bois, de Tocqueville, and Aristotle, are all critics of those principles in one way or another. And this is a dimension of the course that I didn't really have, a, a, that, that I didn't really get into for today's purposes, right? Um, but Du Bois, for instance, I mean, Aristotle is in a way the clearest uh, uh, point of comparison. He asserts that human beings are naturally political, right? He says that the relationship of an individual human being to his city is like the relationship between a hand and a body, right? You can't even think about a human being separate from the whole to which he belongs. Um, the purpose of government is not to secure individual rights. The purpose of government is to provide a kind of communal life in which the virtues can be realized. So it's not about securing our basic needs for Aristotle. It's about what he would view as something higher. Um, and this is a component of the course, <clears throat> by the way. Um, uh, various critiques of those principles. Uh, du Bois... Um, has reservations about the individualism that the Declaration speaks to. It's actually somewhat similar to Aristotle in some ways. Uh, he thinks that we are more parts of communities than we, we, we're more, not just that we're parts of communities. I mean, that the, the writers of the Declaration knew that too, but that in our nature, we're less individuated than the Declaration makes us out to be. Um, Tocqueville's answer is a long question. Uh, <laughs> Tocqueville's answer to this question is the longest one. He's a, uh, I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's a Frenchman who comes to the United States and reflects on all of American political life, all of American political and social life taken as a whole. Um, and he has an ambivalent view of those principles. On the one hand, very necessary. But on the other hand, if we think about ourselves too much as possessors of rights and not enough as members of communities, there's a danger that goes with that. Um, so thank you, Casey Jones. Uh, next, I'm just going to keep going through these directly. Uh, um, I'm going to read them out as I go. Uh, Rena Richter-Meyer asks, 
if Douglas were alive today, what do you think he would say about the current plight of certain minority populations? Um, I think he would, uh, I mean, just to give a quick answer, I think he would bemoan it, but also be hopeful about it. One of the amazing things about Douglas is that, this, you know, he's an individual who himself was born in slavery, uh, who lived through part of Reconstruction, who knew the worst racism, the worst discrimination, and, and who was a slave and beaten and tormented as a slave. Um, but he never lost his sense of optimism or his, his strong personal dignity. And I, I think while he would acknowledge that there were problems, he would have a very hopeful attitude and one that's really again, animated by an appreciation of what a, what a free life is. Um, I will say, I think he would also be amazed uh, by how much progress had been made, right? Maybe he would say it's, it's slower than it should have been, probably was. But I mean, you know, to take a population that, that was enslaved for centuries, right? And, and, and for them to for a president, right, a president of the United States to come from that population is, is an enormous achievement. Uh, and I think Douglas has a kind of, and again, he's a guy who's been through an awful lot, um, uh, but he maintains a kind of optimism that, 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 that's tough to match. Um, okay, uh, Lawrence Bach asks, for those who interpret the Constitution literally, uh, how would Frederick Douglass align with this? Um, yeah, so this is a complicated question. Douglas is not a constitutional lawyer, I would say, right? And as I said at the beginning, this is not really a con law class. Um, the issue is not for him so much to, I don't know what his theory of constitutional interpretation would have been. To, to the best of my knowledge, he never gives it, right? Um, for him, in a way, it's the, the, the principled issue that's the more salient one, right? Is this document intrinsically unjust, uh, and if it is intrinsically unjust, then we should abolish it, right? How can you think about it so that it's not, is it possible to think, is it possible to think honestly about it and not think that it's intrinsically unjust? Um, and his ultimate answer to that is yes. Uh, okay, I think Josiah Daniel again, I can't remember if that was someone from before. How do we get these texts, these ideas, into the hands and the minds of a significant proportion of the electorate who seem headed in the opposite direction. Um, keep having them take classes in my center. Uh, I promise you, we give all our students all these ideas, uh, force feed them to them as it were, uh, make them look at them to graduate. Uh, Josiah, that's our mission, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's at least a part of our mission to expose students who might otherwise miss them to these ideas, these books, these questions. Um, and I, you know, I, I teach this stuff, I mean, not because it pays the bills, I mean, it does that too, but because I think it's important, right? Um, and, and that's, you know, our, our, <laughs> we can only get a couple of hundred students a year, but uh, uh, it's, 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 that's, that's, it is our goal to, to, to expose as many of these, to, to expose uh, uh, to as many students as possible these ideas and questions. Uh, Rod? Koenig or Koenig asks, uh, have you had John Bowles, biographer of Thomas Jefferson, to the Jefferson Center? No, but it's an excellent idea. Uh, Greg Lipscomb writes, where did Locke get the notion that men are equal? It ran counter to most everything around it. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so the first question is what it means for human beings to be equal. Um, uh, and Locke, I think, does mean human beings, right? I think in, at least in principle, he would include women. Um, although, well, I, I don't know, I think so. Um, first and foremost, being equal means that nobody by nature has, not by nature or by divine uh, uh, authority, um, uh, uh, has the right to rule anyone else. Uh, the consequence of that is that all political authority must be established on the basis of consent, right? Um, strength of body, strength of mind, divine gifts, none of that for Locke uh, is sufficient to endow someone with authority, right? Uh, so in that sense, he says, they're equal. Um, as for whether they're equal in talent, virtue, ability, all of that, uh, 
Locke doesn't think so, I think, right? I think that's not Locke's position. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess my answer would just be that the notion is what he means by equal is that no human being has authority over any other, and he gets that first and foremost by disbelieving in the doctrine of divine right of kings. All right, next one. Uh, who is this? Uh, Joan Lewis. Joan Lewis, I think some of your question got cut off. Um, Eric Dempsey asked a question, which is surprising, but let me see if I can answer it. Uh, um, do you think that the increasing division in modern American politics is due to the lack of education and deep understanding of the foundational ideas you discussed? I certainly think it's a big problem, right? Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, I look, I'm, I'm a teacher. I, I speak to a couple of hundred students a year. That's it. Uh, but if, if, if there's any way to get control of sort of political polarization, um, I do think that some kind of, that, that schools are the place to begin that, right? And I, 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 I think, I hope, and I think that Air Center makes an important contribution to that. Um, Greg Lipscomb asks, uh, did equality, oh, follow up to your earlier question. Uh, did equality stem back to the Greeks and the Hebrews? Uh, not the Greeks, right? The Greeks were more aristocratic. It's not, they don't have a notion of human beings as being free and equal by nature. Um, there's more equality in the biblical tradition. Um, this is something I happen to teach in my other class, but even there, uh, there's no notion of natural rights, right? Um, uh, uh, and that's an important difference, I think, right? Um, I, I, you know, earlier when I answered your question, Greg, I said that the, uh, I, I emphasized the fact that there's not an individual who's endowed with authority by nature. It's also true, according to the, to the Declaration at least, um, that all human beings have the same natural rights, right? Uh, there's no, um, the, the Hebrew Bible do, does not contain any kind of notion of natural rights, nor does the Christian New Testament, right? Um, it's clear that every person is of great worth in those texts, right? Um, uh, in the Christian teaching, everyone's even beloved by God, right? Um, but it's not equality in the same sense that Locke means it or the Declaration means it. Uh, Joan Lewis asks, how do students learn about your program? We advertise. Uh, when students are uh, accepted to UT, we're able to invite a certain number of them to apply, and so they get information of our program. Then we send them mailings, um, and then we maintain as much of a public face as we can. Um, and if any of you here today uh, would like to share the good news about our program um, with, with some undergraduates or prospective students whom you know, please do not hesitate. That's great. Um, Greg Lipscomb, second follow-up. Uh, is equality solely a Western notion? Did it ever pop up in Asian philosophy or in government? Greg, this one is outside my area of expertise and I'm going to punt on it, uh, but thank you for the question. Um, Kelsey Cox, Kelsey I know. Uh, could you discuss a bit more fully what, if anything, you take to be distinctive about the kind of patriotism that is produced by a belief in the goodness or rightness of the core principles of liberal democracy, especially as opposed to the kind of patriotism seen in more traditional or non-liberal societies. That's a very good question, Kelsey. Kelsey is one of my students, so hello, Kelsey. Nice to, I, I can't see your face, but nice to see your initials on the screen, at least. Um, yeah, so this is a very good and not very easy question. Um, Traditional kinds of patriotism rest first and foremost, I would say, on, on what I would call love of one's own, right? Love of one's own society, love of one's own community, even love of one's own kind, right? Uh, it grows originally just out of being, I mean, even love of the land, right? Love of the, 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 the earth on which you live is an important component of traditional uh, uh, is an important component of traditional um, patriotism, right? Uh, 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 just, 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 just a kind of inborn love of the community of which you're a part. The sort of patriotism that comes through reflection on principles, right, uh, I think is different, right? It's First of all, it grows out of 
reflection more than it grows out of instinct, right? Um, and second, it's, it's, it's more universally applicable because in principle, anyone who can recognize the truth and goodness of those principles could be a patriot. Now, I think we have to say when we examine American political history that it's not, it's not so simply the case that patriotism comes only from a reflection on the goodness of the institutions, right? Um, it's, it's, it, it comes also, I mean, a, a, the text I have in mind here, uh, Abraham Lincoln, right, um, uh, uh, when he was a kid, not a kid, but like in his 20s, um, gave a speech uh, which is known as the Lyceum Address, uh, which was called on the perpetuation of our political institutions. And he spoke about what had attached people to the American regime, right, to American politics uh, in the early parts of our history. So he's giving us in the 18, I think it's the 1820s, right, reflecting on, maybe it's the 1830s, I guess the 1830s, um, uh, but reflecting on the, the era of the revolution, right? Um, and he says the Revolutionary War had a, way, had a way of, just the American Revolution had a way of creating a sense of patriotism because there was this great action, right, um, that everybody did together, right? Uh, um, there, there was a kind of, there, there was a great war in which we were engaged. There were sacrifices of blood and treasure made on behalf of that. And it fostered a kind of natural, deep love of country, right? Um, uh, I mean, this, I guess, is part of how patriotism usually comes into being, right? Um, uh, you develop a sense of your shared history and the nobility of that shared history. For Lincoln, writing this Lyceum Address, it was a grave question how, if there were no other war like that, real patriotism could ever be fostered again, right? Um, and I mean, I think it's just true that human nature, so what does patriotism mean, right? If patriotism means loving your country before yourself, it's very hard to foster that on the basis of any doctrine at all, right? In a way, it's more the experience of history and the, 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 the personally knowing even people who have been through great sacrifices, people who have served on, on its behalf that really makes that strong. Um, think about what people say as the people, the, 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 the ones who fought in World War II, the World War II generation is the greatest generation, right? And that, I think that's Tom Brokaw who, who coined that phrase. Um, but I think the idea was that by fighting in such a great war that required such a strong civic spirit and so many sacrifices on the part of so many, you developed a real sense of civic cohesion and mutual kind of concern. Um, it's just very tough to do that in a way on the basis of mere reflection. Right? Um, anyway, uh, uh, okay, Kelsey, sorry, that was a little bit rambly, but that's a very good question. All right, I believe I have one question left. Uh, uh, a few of you I won't get to, I apologize for that, but I'm being told that I should answer just one more and then let you all go. Uh, so Stephen Seltzer asks the following. Do you find that the students who tend to take this class lean left, so you are preaching to the choir, or are you able to open the minds of a general mix of students? Um, <laughs> I think I do open the minds of a general mix of students. If anything, I find conservative students, uh, uh, students who lean right, uh, if anything, are more receptive to this than students who lean left. Uh, 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 but it's really meant for everybody. I mean, I'm not a, I mean, I'm not supposed to say this, I, I would not count myself as a person of the left. Um, uh, but um, uh, no, I don't find I'm preaching to the choir. Um, look, even among the thinkers that we read, there are very sharp disagreements, right? We never, you know, you, know, you, you can take, we, we look at Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. We look at James Baldwin and Martin Luther King. We look at people who really clash with one another, right? Um, and the point of this class, again, I'm not 
like I don't teach like a preacher, right? I just try to give people, try to show people what, what minds that are stronger than mine have thought about serious questions. Um, we are certainly not, I mean, I wouldn't regard us as a program or my classes as being either of the right or the left. It seems to me that these ideas uh, uh, transcend those distinctions. Um, and again, I mean, it sounds hokey, I guess, but if we're going to get beyond some of our insane political polarization, finding that we have certain important things in common, in my judgment, is really essential. All right. I'm told I need to end. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Angie, do you want to say something? Yes, actually, could we do one more? So if you have one more minute, um, John Hartman asks, do you see the intense polarization of this moment as threatening to the foundation of our constitutional democracy? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I wish I could say no, but yes. Um, uh, and that's why I think it's so important to study the Constitution, to study the ideas behind the Constitution and to see what's, what, to, to, to see whether there's any, to see, to see what the thoughts behind the Constitution are and to think for ourselves about whether they're, they're true thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Dempsey. Um, on behalf of the University of Texas College of Liberal Arts Development and Public Affairs teams, we want to thank both Dr. Dempsey and all, your, all the attendees for sharing your valuable time with us.